Welcome to Trains. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Balchunas. Eric, some things are going a little crazy in the currency world, and cash is kind of an interesting story right now. It has not been interesting for a really long time, and now suddenly it's interesting. Well, it's boring always to me. I mean, this is short term debt is probably one of the most boring areas of the ETF world to cover, but right now it's kind of sexy because uh, it's sort of sometimes it is performance chasing to go to something so boring. Um, it also yields more. So there's been $31 billion into ultra short debt ETFs, which would be one year or less maturity. Right, so everybody is just hiding out. They've just run into the cave. The Fed, the Fed scared them away. Yeah, they're on the sidelines. Whatever metaphor you want to use, they are totally scared. The Fed has just wreaked havoc on everybody's brains, and um, this is sort of the 180 they pulled on the market. So, you know, as somebody in one of the articles on Bloomberg today said, um, now is not a time to be a hero, which I think really sums up this market. So we're seeing a lot of money into cash, but that'd be a good idea to sort of break down what these ETFs are, what they do. They're not exactly cash, but they're really close to it. And and this also relates to what's happening in currency because the strength of the dollar globally is just on a tear. And we're seeing things like the pound this week just get hammered. So I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit here too. Joining us going to be uh, Katie Greifeld from Bloomberg News and James Seifert from Bloomberg Intelligence. This time on Trillions, cash is king. Katie, James, welcome back to Trillions. How are you guys? Thanks for having me. Okay, Katie, I want to start with you. Yeah. Because you and I have been talking about cash as king for a second. Got you mm-hmm. working on a Business Week story to that effect. Talk to us. What do you see? I'm kind of obsessed with it at this moment. I know that Eric just absolutely ripped on it. Uh, I think it's actually a pretty interesting area to cover right now. I mean, on our show, ETF IQ, for weeks you've been talking about the safety dance back into cash. Clearly, a lot of investors agree with me. I do think we're at an interesting moment where cash always has this connotation of being kind of cowardly, kind of boring, to Eric's point. But I mean, it yields so much right now. A six-month Treasury bill, bill yields as much as a 10-year Treasury note with like magnitudes less duration. Yeah, well, like why would you not do that, right? Because yeah. duration is so important when inflation's a factor, right? So, so what do you get in that six-month uh, that you know uh, uh, is safer than the, the 10-year bet, right? Well, you do get a place to hang out. You also get the peace of mind of knowing that. You know, a single day's yield movements aren't going to totally decimate your P&L. I mean, you're still on a real basis not keeping up with inflation, but you're probably doing a lot better than pretty much any other place unless you're like all in on U.S. dollars right now. Well, that's sort of my point with this is people must be really scared to go into this ultra short term debt because you're right. It doesn't move as much off of off of interest rates, but that is where the Fed is hiking. They're hiking right in your face. So like SHV and SHY are down. So you could get that 3 4% yield, but you are going to lose from the price going down because the Fed just hiked again in your face. So it's not like a clean 4%. It's a risky 4%. But again, it's better than the alternative, I guess. Is this the new TINA? Is this the new TINA? I've heard so many tortured new acronyms for there is no alternative. I've heard there are too many alternatives. Now I feel like that, that one doesn't quite have a ring to it, though. What about... Sell the rip is the new buy the dip. I know you like that one. <laughs> that one's just really hard to say on the fly. You have to think about the words. I know. I screwed are... that up on air on TV. I, I, I it got all jumbled in my head right when I was about to say it. Buy the I nailed chips. it in rehearsal. And then in, in the thing, I was like, wait, is it buy the rips? I was like, oh, and man. I, yeah. head, head game. You, yeah. can't, you can't peek in rehearsal. <laughs> I know. I did. Okay. So cash is, cash is an asset class, Katie. Walk us through the options because sure, you can take that six month, but even like a a uh, savings account in your bank looks pretty good right now. Absolutely. Let's talk about one of the more interesting funds, I think, is BIL. That's one to three month treasury bills, right? And I wrote this story a few months ago, but they're actually paying out monthly dividends again. And for a lot of investors, that's basically the core investing thesis. I'm going to put my money here. I'm going to get a reliable fixed income payment. It all starts to make sense. For a long time, these weren't paying out anything. That all but totally stopped during the pandemic when the Fed took rates to zero. And again, to Eric's point, you can still lose out on the price, but you are getting pennies again. It was pennies in July that's been steadily increasing as the Fed has just been absolutely is it a nickel relentless. Yet? It's, uh, I think it's pretty dang close. <laughs> I mean, there was a, a, lot, a long time where some of the haters on Twitter would be like, the Fed is killing savers. 
like post World War II, you could always get a good yield on your on your like your aunt would give you a savings bond, and now he, they destroyed that. Well, now it's back. Uh, the problem is the markets are all crushed. Uh, it was the cost of doing it, I guess. James, what's your take when you think of ultra short term debt ETFs? Like, wh- what do you think? What are you looking for? Do you think yeah. they're boring? Well, I do think they're boring, Eric. We'll we'll see these filings. So as you know, we track filings for new ETFs that come out, and every like all, every issuer has a short term debt ETF. It's act some are actively managed, many are, and he just sends like he'll send a link with the filing and just put like a bunch of Z's. Brutal. <laughs> Nothing else. Gosh. Um, I know every single legacy mutual fund company that comes in the ETF space has to file an ultra short term debt ETF. And then an income ETF and, and an a dividend ESG e- ETF and an ESG, and I'm just like, oh my god, I need more espresso to because I'm getting drowsy <laughs> get reading that, this. Perspective. Get that morning orange juice. Yeah, the the other side of this is that I I think rebalancing is another key factor here. So if we keep talking about the Fed hiking rates. You're crushing fixed income. So if you have a 60 40 portfolio and your fixed income is going down or whatever whatever mix you have in your portfolio, you probably need to buy more to maintain that allocation. So rather than going into corporates or longer dated things, they're choosing to go limited duration, limited credit risk. They're going to these ultra short things. They're going to treasuries. So there's all these different things that are going that forcing people into treasuries and short term treasuries specifically. So what are some tickers that are of interest to you, James? Uh, well, we shy bill SHV. I mean, all they're they're pretty standard. There's there's some there's some iShares ones out there too. JP Morgan also JPST. Oh, Jeppy, and then Jeppy, which yeah. is another one. There, there's a lot well, of things. Jeppy is the income, right? The, yes, the, are you being, thinking JPST? Oh, JPST is what I'm thinking. So of. let's let's take a second to divide the difference between Bill SHV and SHY, which are pure treasuries. Those are probably the closest thing to cash. B- Bill is the only one that I think is yeah, one, to one to three, three months. Month. That's really short. You, SHY gonna... is on one to three year. Yeah. Um. So you take a little more risk, you get a little more yield. Now, explain JPST, uh, which is the JP Morgan. It's not treasuries. I mean, this is a little more risky, right? Yeah, it's actively managed, and they don't just hold treasuries, but it's also short term. But JP Morgan is selling it pretty well. I mean, it's taking in money hand over fist of pretty much All every day. All of these day, are, right? Like. What are the inflows like here? $31 billion in a year. So the record, I believe, is around $38 billion. We're mm. probably going to pass it. And that was set in 2008, which, you know, was a really rough year, Volmageddon and all that. So people ran into cash. So, yeah, probably break the record for all-time flows here. Um, on JPST and Mint, those are two funds. This is an interesting niche that activists found, actually. You know, PASS has been, like, ruling the, the land for a while. People do, like, giving their money to PIMCO or JP Morgan and saying, look, keep me short duration so there's no interest rate risk. But take little bets. Maybe you buy an international bond or a corporate bond. Try to give me a little more um, return or yield uh, so I almost like their money market funds with like a little hot sauce in there. But th- as we know, in 2020, they're not cash because they did go down quickly, unlike a money market fund where you might have uh, a lot more stability. These can go down. Well, to your point that this has been an interesting niche for active to proliferate, I think it's a really interesting sign of the, sign of the times that for much of the last two years, it, starting in the pandemic, it was ARK that was the biggest active manager. ARK K was the biggest actively managed fund. Now it's JPST, I believe, which is, again, one of these short duration, boring bond ETFs just really sort of paints the mood of the market. You're right. That is a symbolic move, similar to how the innovation theme was the top one. Now it's natural resources. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the times are a change in Joel. Quickly. Quickly, and it all, all it took was J Powell making some moves. Well, and inflation print and inflation. We, yeah. we keep talking about this. All, money markets. We brought them up, but they're they're paying almost three percent. They're over, they're well over two percent now. Savings accounts. If you have an online savings account, they're yielding over two percent. They're probably going to be near three within the next month or two. We could be over four percent or near four percent in savings accounts uh, by the end of the but year. But what's your sixty forty down? That's the problem. Correct, but yeah. I'm saying it's, I the, agree. The, the the savings accounts and the money market accounts aren't as as subject to the risk as uh, some of these other things. So I'm kind of surprised so much money is going to these ETFs when theoretically, if you're, I mean, if you're at a brokerage account, you have, you have access to a money market fund, whether it's Vanguard or whatever it may be, it's going to be paying higher interest rates and obviously going to have a lower duration risk. But then obviously, if the Fed does cut rates, you don't get the same upward potential. That Sounds you like you're in cash, though. <laughs> I, I I mean, <laughs> it's a joke. It's he's a not joke. allowed to give investment. I, I don't. No, no, no. I, I personally don't own any short-term treasury ETFs. No, I do not. I'm gonna write that down. There's also the option of going with a floating rate note. So, like um, Wisdom Tree, USFR, and T Flow have also taken in a ton of money. Um, again, boring, but they would float with the interest rates, and so that's been a popular trade. And senior loans are like a high yield version of that. So if we think about this being this flight to safety and just like chill on the sidelines, 
How long do you think this sticks around for? What, what are investors going to be looking for before they go from from these moves elsewhere? So I so I, I sit next to Ira Jersey, who is our great strategist. He's been on the podcast before. So right now, the market is pricing for the Fed to hike basically 75 basis points, then 50 in December. So 75 November, 50 in December, and a little bit more through March. And then the market is basically pricing for them to start cutting rates pretty quickly in the spring. Ira, the Fed... Um, our economist team believe that we're going to stay flat at that higher plateau for much longer than the market is pricing. Obviously, the market can change things. I mean, if you talk to anyone, if they asked you if we thought we were going to be at 3 or 4% by the fall, uh, no one would have said that. But basically, our Bloomberg intelligence team thinks that we're going to get above that 4% level and sit there for a good chunk of 2023. Which, and that'll impact everything. Well, that theoretically bodes well for cash if the Fed sits at terminal for a while and rates just sort of stay at this very relatively very high plateau. That would mean your T-bills continue to pay out pretty lofty yields. Yeah. Which means maybe you, this wasn't the place to be a year ago as rates went up, but if this is where rates stay, then being there now could be good for a while. Especially if inflation does, if, especially if the Fed does get inflation under control. That's a, I would agree Here's with that. Here's the thing with the inflation number, which is confusing, and Ira worked this out with us a little bit. The month over month has been pretty nice for the past couple months. It hasn't like shown a, a huge move. But again, year over year, still like 8%, right? 8, 9%. Well, the year over year was, I think the first jump was what, six, seven months ago? Mm -hmm. Was that when the first print hit? Don't we have to go 12 months to go back to where the high water mark is now, where then it's under 2%? So it would seem to me nothing will get resolved until a whole year passes from that shock print. So You're asking me to do some math right here. We're talking about you basic don't talk facts. dot plots. <laughs> <laughs> you, I know you like the dot plot. You I got <laughs> dragged on Twitter. Oh, you for did. That. Yeah. yeah. That's no, fine. she she messed with the dot plot. The dot plot crowd. They were not happy. No. But I, some people were on your side. Some people joined. Well, it was the... a joke. I said that the dot plot is a meaningless image. It's so silly. And someone said, "You're a financial journalist. <laughs> How could this mean nothing to you?" Okay. But the best comment that someone gave to me was. A line is a dot that went for a walk. Mm. Mm. Spoken like an artist. Yeah. I do think, you know, one, I, one thing I will say uh, to your point, and uh, I think Ram Capital was the one who said, yeah, that's because it's meaningless because these people don't really know what they're talking about. They're always wrong. Um, and they have missed a lot. Nobody called this, as James just pointed out. The other thing that kind of annoys me is the sell side research people who come out like it's like Goldman now has an S&P outlook and they just revised it down because the market had a rough week. I'm like, well, you can't do that. You, you pick it at the beginning of the year and stick to it. Like, I don't understand that prediction based on what just happened. I, I, get, I get why they do it, but it just seems like, why am I going to listen at all then? I'll just look at past performance and extrapolate that forward and go, that's what the sell side thinks. Well, the Fed, to their credit, I feel like they try to stress that these are not forecast necessarily or this this is not like a set in stone policy yeah they're going to react to what happens right? yeah they do try to get that message across but everyone just takes it like they're data dependent exactly <laughs> well hold on exactly. though it, 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 really good um when i was uh, lucky enough to guest host the close one so time, fun yeah we had the white house person on you know the economic advisor so i never get to ask these non-etf questions but i did and i was sort of like talking about the election because inflation is by far the number one issue with voters it took COVID's place 30% of voters say it's the number one issue. COVID's now 1%. It completely flip-flopped. And so I think the Fed has a political pressure as well because this is the biggest issue for the election. So I do wonder if we have this election, the midterms, if there might be a little bit of the foot off the gas just because there's the political pressure might die down a little bit because there's no election coming up. I don't think it's political pressure. I think it's part of the mandate, right? They have a mandate, and this is part of the mandate. But yeah. it's hard to untangle politics from the mandate, in my opinion. But I suppose you're right. I just I don't know. I just can't see the Fed as completely apolitical. I just can't. No, I'm with you. But they do have a mandate They're They're targeting a specific amount of inflation. And they have basically said they expect to hike, What's in, interesting hike to me, into un, more higher unemployment. What's interesting to me becomes if, if they actually say 2% is unrealistic anymore and like 3% becomes the new 2%. But we'll see where that ends up. It is amazing that they've stuck to it. But again, if, if your goal is to go not over 2% from when, like, okay, jumped 8%. So we'll call that the new normal. You're saying no 2% from where the new high water mark is. So all, all they've actually accomplished that to a degree because the month over month hasn't gone up. So all they got to do is wait a year. So I do sometimes wonder why they're continuing to hike, given that all they got to, like, they're not trying to get the 8% down, back down to where it was. That ship has sailed. 
It's just a matter of keeping that 8% year over year where it is, which they're doing, right? Yeah. Well, for the most part, though, there's, you, you can break out core CPI. We can get into the real details of inflation numbers. Um, but we can get into the details of inflation, which I don't think we should really necessarily do in this podcast. But if you look at inflation, one of the things that's baked in is is rent and homeowners equivalent rent. Those things, it takes it's like a lagging indicator. So that's going to take time to filter through the inflation numbers. So we're basically guaranteed to get higher inflation to some extent. So the problem is, is the Fed looking at leading indicators or lagging indicators? And that's what they're trying to wrestle with. And so you have people on both sides arguing that the Fed's hiking too much now because most of the inflation is behind us, like you're kind of arguing, Eric. And then people are saying, well, there's still supply chain issues. Uses other issues, so we need to make sure that we don't let it get out of control. Because once inflation starts going, it'll keep going. I have a question about ETFs. To bring it back to ETFs, so the Fed, Jerome Powell, obviously has made it very clear that they're going to hike into inflation, even if it tips the economy into a recession. And with that in mind, I think it's interesting. In addition to all of the short-term flows we've seen into these cash-like ETFs, you're also seeing TLT get a lot of love recently, a lot more love for duration. It feels like it's just the middle, the belly, if you will, that uh, isn't seeing a lot of sparkle right now. I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah. So I, I, the way I look at it, there's like a whole bunch of reasons why treasury ETFs are getting because it's not even just TLT on the long end. Those are 20 plus years. It's it's the middle of the curve. Every All treasuries are taking in money. And if you talk to people, a lot of people think the Fed is going to hike us into a recession and then they're going to get cold feet and then they're going to start cutting rates again. So if they start cutting rates and you're, you're in these high duration treasuries, you're going to shoot off like a rocket ship like we saw TLT do numerous times when the Fed starts cutting rates. I agree. I think TLT is a recession play. It's it's betting the Fed has gone too far, whereas I think the cash is more of a hiding out. I think TLT is more of a bet. I, I would agree with James on that. Yes. Yeah, so that is not, it's not a really safe place to be. TLT does do a good job buffering stocks typically, but not this time. I mean, so. also the duration, like we talked about, I don't know, 15 minutes ago, you can get your face ripped off. <laughs> oh, yeah. TLT is uh, pretty, pretty volatile. I, I think, you know, uh, but your to James's point, that's why I like I like uh, GOVT. Yeah. This is the iShares. It goes. It just buys the whole curve in mm. one shot. So you own everything. So you get a little recession bet, a little cash, a little you know. Uh, and that one I think might be the top ten most successful ETFs of the year, maybe top fifteen. Okay, so we've talked about cash. We've talked about some debt. Let's talk about what's happening in the currency ETFs. Katie, what sticks out to you? I guess UUP, that's Invesco's bullish dollar fund. It's absolutely crushing it this year. It's up 18% at a record high and then some. But I keep looking for a size and scope to write about beyond the fact that it's at a record high. But the flows just haven't really matched that performance. Yeah. And let's be clear, 18% for a currency ETF is ridiculous. That That's not a lot for a growth fund or whatever. But for currency, that is an absurd amount of return. Um, What's interesting about currency ETFs that just, you know, straight bet on currencies, they've never really had a market in the ETF world. They've real small. They've never got gone mainstream. My theory is that people, regular people just don't do currency betting. They just don't need it. They're long the dollar plenty with all their other investments. There's no reason. So I think it appeals to a certain kind of trading crowd, maybe a institutional who wants to quickly put on this trade. I just think it's a niche area and it always will be. Um, um, but James, let's tell people, what does UUP do? Like, how does it give you exposure to, a quote, long the dollar? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of confusing because you think, I'll just hold the dollar, but that's not going to give you this performance that right. we're seeing. So the way UUP does it or anyone hedges in the market, so in this case, they go, they go long dollar futures, and then they short the euro, the yen, the great British pound, the Canadian dollar, the Swedish krona, and the Swiss franc. So it's usually long whatever the currency is you're talking about, and that then short a basket. Well <laughs> yeah, and then short a basket yeah. of other currencies. It's literally yeah. like a long short fund. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not just holding a dollar bill in a bank. Boy, that is the perfect strategy for this year. <laughs> it is. But p- other issuers have different takes on this trade. Like Wisdom Tree has USDU. This one goes long the dollar, but then it shorts emerging market currencies as well as the developed international. So you get a broader uh, short, but. The emerging market currencies haven't been as as bad. So UUP is outperforming this year, but that could change. But I think there has been great innovation in this space, but again, not a ton of buyers. Now, where we have seen buyers over the years is currency hedged ETFs, which go long, uh, say, Japanese stocks or uh, developed international stocks, and then they neutralize the currency effect. Those ETFs are ha- had their day back in the day, but now they're coming back because the stronger the dollar is, the better the currency hedged ETFs are. But no one is buying them. It's like the second time around, no one cares. Why do you think that is? 
Yeah, I, so I think we 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 often debate this on our team multiple times because we thought this is going to be the year for currency hedge ETFs that the dollar really does go strong. And I mean, the performance has been incredible. I mean, all of the currency hedge versions, whether it's Europe, whether it's global, Japan, all of the above, they've crushed their unhedged counterparts and still they have taken in virtually no money. I mean, it's not no money, but it's it's almost non-existent compared to what it was. You look at a chart, it's just billions flowing out for years. The outflow has stopped and there's been a trickle of inflows, but the fish just aren't biting. Here's my theory, Joel, and this yeah, why, to- why is that? Because Eric, I actually remember this was like how you and I got to meet each other was talking about the currency hedged ETF effect. Oh, it was so a- like of this, you know, you would think this would be that moment for this strategy. And Wisdom Tree, as I recall, was a big player in it. Still, still the big ones. Yeah, Wisdom Tree, um, DWS, and iShares are all the big ones. But here's my theory on this, which is that. When currency hedged ETFs happened back in 2012 to 2015, the cr- it was a craze. DXJ was the number one inflow getter for a year. I think it's the first and only time it wasn't Vanguard or BlackRock. I mean, that's insane. Um, I think people got on it like a ride at the amusement park. <laughs> surfboard was what yeah, you called it. Yeah, surfboard. And then the ride ran out. Yeah, and then the, the dollar got weaker and the trade sort of didn't work as well. And people soured on it and said, oh, that wasn't as fun as I thought it was. They got out. And now that it's working, people are like, you know what? Been there, done that. I, I think I'll pass this time. I'll do and, the cash. I'll yeah, just sit in the cash. Yeah. Nice and boring. <laughs> like, this is why I'm bearish ESG versus the hype. I believe now this year that we're seeing ESG underperform generally because oil is up and oil stocks are up. I think any tourists that come in and have that experience, they go in with a little too much like starry eyes and they, they're not really careful what they're doing. They just went, bought it because it went up. They get that sort of feeling of like um, seller's remorse, buyer's remorse rather. And they don't. They will not take a second bite at that apple. So when ESG starts outperforming next time tech is up, I don't. So that's why I think ESG is limited, and that's why I think currency edge ETFs are having the problems they do, um, which is simply because you know people been there, done that, and they're just not interested this time. Yeah, and I think like the round trip trade. So people went in, and I think a lot of people just didn't take money out initially. Like you look at it, the performance went down really bad, and money didn't really come out. They just kind of sat in there, and it lost its value. It's lost its assets via performance. So I think people just saw that in the round trip trade and said, if they had just stayed in the other thing for an extended period of time, they would have been the same because currencies just fluctuate. They go up and down. Specifically in equities, it's not as critical. So if you're going to currency hedge, it's more like you have to market time essentially. I think people, a lot of people, just give up on market timing. You know, the people who sell currency hedge ETFs make a great case they're like look everything you have is long the dollar your house everything you know your bank account your all your funds all your stocks why not hedge in this case to have something that isn't exposed to the dollar um now someone like bogle they they would argue you you would you shouldn't do it because you, you should always be long the dollar that's your whole lifestyle so why bother with that so i get both sides but i think msci had a study i'll probably get called out for this but i think this is my recollection they did look at the hedged and unhedged over like a long period, and it wasn't that big of a difference. Um, but there are times when obviously one is going to be outperforming, and then it will underperform. And this is sort of the problem with ETFs that veer from a benchmark. You have your heyday, and then you have your underperformance. And the people who typically should go into these strategies are people who really understand what they're doing and can stomach that period of, of drawdown. So anybody listening, I, that's my advice for anybody on all this, and especially ESG. I'm like, look, if you're hardcore and you live an ESG lifestyle, and this is your thing, you're probably fine for ESG because you can stomach when it doesn't work. Um, But a tourist, I'd be very careful because sometimes people just don't like to underperform and they usually sell at the wrong time and buy at the wrong time. And that's, you know, where bad behavior comes from. And for everybody else, there's cash. Yeah, back to cash. Katie James, thanks for joining us on Trillions. Thank you for having me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Trillions. Until next time, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal, Bloomberg.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you'd like to listen. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Twitter. I'm at Joel Weber Show. He's at Eric Balchunas. This episode of Trillions was produced by Magnus Hendrickson. Bye.